Today we're joined by Nina Dunwoody, Lead Data Delivery Manager at Co-op. This episode offers insights into Nina's career journey, including how she quickly figured out that university wasn't for her and took an alternative route into the data space. I actually did three months of university, decided it wasn't for me and ended up on an apprenticeship in, in sort of relationship management. So just to put to bed that, you know, he needs to get a degree to progress in, in technical careers. Nina also stresses the criticality of aligning data strategy with overall business objectives, creating psychologically safe work environments and being an empathetic leader who models positive behaviours. There's going to be things you don't know. It is so important to create that environment where everybody feels it's okay to not know everything. They're not going to be laughed at. They're not going to be judged. I think often, you know, we can have our own sort of insecurities that we have to handle, but a business can help that by creating that welcoming, kind, inclusive environment. Her insights make for a great listen for those interested in people-focused leadership, fostering inclusive work environments and exploring alternative paths to success. Enjoy! Nina, let's talk data. So I'd like to start with a quote from Simon Sinek, the author and inspirational talker. And he says, the best leaders are also the best followers. They follow a purpose, cause or bigger belief than themselves. The greatest contribution of a leader is to make other leaders. So what do you think about that? And what would you say your main purpose or belief is as a data leader? So... There's a couple of strap lines that uh, people are probably fed up with me using now. Um, and <laughs> Love the first a strap line. One, exactly. <laughs> um, the first one is that people are at the heart of delivery. Mm-hmm. And that's not necessarily just with data. Um, but I think if you think back to, I don't know, probably when I started my career, I don't want to say the number of years, but think <laughs> back 10, 15 years. Um, and if you now think about in you know the corporate world in you know wider news how big data is as a as a topic is massively changed um i think if you think stereotypically and this is definitely stereotypically it's quite a male it, it's seen as yeah be male dominated mm-hmm. it's seen as you, you know and i'm going to the extremes here people coding developing heads down maybe Introvert. introverted yeah that's generally probably where it where it's been mm. that's now definitely got to change mm-hmm. you, know, you look at things like ai you know it's everywhere um we have to be able to talk about it in a human-centric way in a people-centric mm-hmm. way so it has to relate to the world it has to relate to people you take ai again as an example that is just a data-driven solution mm. so in order to use it we have to understand people behaviors so you have to have leaders that are able to translate that tech into the business speak and that's a that's a massive thing for me because I didn't come from a particularly technical background um, you grow knowledge really quickly when you're working with the experts but people are absolutely at the heart of it all like you can have the best tech you can have the best tools you can have the most amazing strategy but if you don't have people if you don't look after your people mm-hmm. there's no one to deliver it there's no one to support it um, and ultimately, it's probably not designed with the end user in mind either. Yeah, absolutely. And that is a myth I'd like to debunk as well, like that association with techies, it's male dominated. Um, you've got to be good at maths, for example, like all these things that there's truth in some of it, but others, they're not at all. So how do you think we can make the environment more inclusive? It's breaking down barriers, ultimately. Because if I think back to the start of my career, if you just said to me I was working in a data team, or you know, working with data strategy, working with technical in a technical IT environment, I probably would have said, no, no way, that that's <laughs> not me. You know, I don't know. I like communications. I like English. I like adding value, making a difference in the world. It's I think it's making tech and data meaningful, and I think you know, podcasts such as this can help. Um, but it probably starts from you know s- school age. Really, I think the education sector probably needs to tackle it a little bit more to make it give equal opportunities ultimately to understand how data is integrated into our everyday lives um you know when i first came to the data world probably only i say date data specifically five years ago probably linked to with software um development and digital a few years before that i had no idea how every single piece of technology a business uses relies on it every you know every customer transaction or interaction with a store there's data created yeah 
Um, and when we look at things like data quality, which obviously has a massive impact on AI, um, every single person in a business is responsible or accountable for that being as good as it can be. So a store colleague registering sale, yeah. um, you know, a, a customer service representative entering details or um, information, or AI might replace some of that possibly, <laughs> but, um, you know, everyone is responsible and accountable for either using or impacting or being involved with, with data in some way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and data is ubiquitous. You know, it affects all of us. It's not always the understanding. And I know some businesses are better that data strategy is very much aligned with the, the overall business strategy. And then others, it's it's quite separate. So what's your experience been with that in the, the teams you've worked in and the companies? So I think there's two angles you could look at this. Mm. So there's a perspective that really data should drive decisions on the overarching organisational strategy in the first place. Yeah. Um, and then there's obviously, you've got an organisational strategy, and then if a data team has, a, has its own strategy, um, obviously you'd expect most organisations to to have its have a data strategy, that should absolutely be aligned to what the business is trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, and one thing I've always, from a d data delivery perspective, I always work with every, sin every single individual in a team to make sure that they understand why they're doing something. Yeah. Because I think that the, sometimes the, the place we can fall into is, you know, agile as it was the buzzword 10 years ago. It's it's now generally a way of working understood and used by the majority of, of certainly uh, development, whether software data yeah. teams. You can get a backlog full of tasks, full of stories, um, but I think when you get down to that task level, you might have an engineer that, that just goes, right, take this task off, that task off. You actually stop them and say, actually, why, why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that whatever piece of development, whatever piece of tech you're working on, you should absolutely understand what value it's driving to the end user, not just, you know, it's a component that's going to be delivered to, to this team, to then, to then output to the business in some way. We should always understand projects, you know, story task level, what value is it delivering and how does it help the business achieve its strategy? Because then I think you feel part of yeah. something as well. You feel important, you feel valued. Um, and I think without that, without that link, without every single thing you're doing, driving where the business wants to go to, you've got to sort of question why you're doing it. Yeah. You know, like you can, we all have sort of things that we love to do we all have pet projects we all have passions but ultimately we are paid by a business to do a job so everything that you know you do whether it's whether it's data whether it's wider tech and change it should be driving the direction that the business wants to go in and we yeah. should all feel part of that journey together and i think that then comes back to that inclusivity that understanding and you're more likely then, I think, to deliver the quality that needs to come out the other end because you understand why you're doing that piece of code, that bit of development. You understand who's going to use it and you understand what it should be doing. Yeah. Um, and obviously then comes that integration with the with the wider business as well, which I think is really important. Yeah, absolutely. And that's going back to Simon Sinek also. He talks about it starts with the why and it is your greater purpose because you know we all have purposes and they may be to do with work and not to do with work but ultimately what gets you up in the morning hopefully it is your job and like you said you know if it's that bigger picture oh this is going to impact the business in a successful way it's probably going to drive you more than just like you said I've got some tasks to complete and I'm just going to tick them off so do you drive has that helped you on a personal level with work as well and earlier on in your career did you have that why that purpose behind your work um I think I've always loved work. So I come from a sporting background. Right, so yeah. I was all into my sport, obviously got to a point. Um, I decided to then pursue sort of A-levels and, and university instead. Um, ironically, just for the inclusivity bit, I actually did three months of university, decided it wasn't for me and ended up on a on a, a apprenticeship in, right. in sort of relationship management. So um, just to put to bed that, you know, you need to get a degree to... Um, to progress in, in technical careers. Another myth we're debunking. Exactly. <laughs> and I think for a while it was sort of plough everything into work mm. majority of the time. Um, I think certainly when you're younger, you don't perhaps have quite as many other responsibilities. Um, so I became a mum around 2020. And I think that's when I had to try and find that work-life balance a little bit more. Um, but on 
probably from another angle I think work has often sort of saved me in some ways mm. so for me if I've been going through which I actually did last year it's, it's towards the the end of 2023 into, 20, into this year 2024 um, I went through quite a tough time personally so for me when my home life wasn't that great having a work family massively helped me um to a point save me in some way so I think there's a understanding your purpose and being inspired and motivated by what you do and putting you all into what you do but then I think there's a part of being part of another what I call work family I know lots of people think that's really cliche but I do think you can find it and I've certainly found it before Mm -hmm. um fairly recently um moved organization and I'm getting that feeling again to feel part of a work family gives you it if you're part of the right work family you can bring your authentic self to work and I think you can grow in probably more ways than more ways than you, you can expect yeah and I know human centric leadership psychological safety you know we've had Nick Walker on and he talks passionately about that also working in the same organization as yourself now at the co-op and but that's really important to you so interestingly and thank you for sharing you know you had struggles was the business set up in a structured manner to deal with that or was it just was it was it handled in a corporate way or just very like a human level way like we're here if you need us like could you just talk us through what kind of support they gave you yeah um and absolutely nick and i very much align i think he's obviously got his human centric um leadership model that he's that he's working on and obviously been here and talked about um and i'm bringing probably more of a delivery focus to that but absolutely in alignment um for me so i like i said a really tough situation at home um so it went through essentially a toxic abusive relationship that I had to try and exit um for about a year I was handling that fairly quietly mm. I'd say but I was able to manage it because I'd you know have a rough time at home I'd come in and I'd get to the office and I'd just sort of work switch face off, off. Try yeah. And, yeah try and, and switch off I think for me what I've always done in in my last organization at pets at home I built relationships and that's still exactly what I've done. So three weeks into the co-op, I am all about building relationships. And my task when I joined Pets at Home was to bring the data team from from quite a centralised silo Mm -hmm. into the heart of of tech and change and the organisation. So sort of six months to a year on, I'd built up a massive amount of relationships within tech and change across the wider business. um, And we'd really data had, had come to the the heart of pets and as you you know you, you've probably seen they've launched the pet care platform their entire organization is you know driven by by data and innovation amazing um so i'd built up a lot of relationships and i think it was probably a couple of strong relationships with colleagues and that goes from director level to peers a couple in particular couple of people in particular gave me a, a safe space ultimately mm. um so there was one director in particular now absolutely a close friend who i always remember actually it was a, it was a christmas uh christmas do for one of the teams and it got to a point at the end of the night it was actually i say that it wasn't even my direct team it was another team that was very closely linked in with and this was you know how pets was it was yeah it was a real family and i just remember saying at the end of the night um she said did you get home okay and i said oh did you get home safe and i said I got home not necessarily safe um and it was at that point she said right should we have a chat and she just because of the relationship I'd built up she gave me that opening to mm. to talk um and encouraged me that actually getting help through work was okay because I was a little bit like I'm career focused you know work's going great I don't want it to impact um and she got me sat down with the people team ultimately and another absolutely incredible leader in the people team just said just don't panic if you want to stay in the office stay if you don't don't and this is the support that's that's available um and I think for a while I balanced it but it things at home got a little bit tougher um Mm -hmm. and it did get to a point where I think I was I was still struggling yeah and I hit a point outside of work with various things that had gone on um I think I hit an exhaustion point a burnout point because if anything I'd probably used work a little bit Mm -hmm. I'd used it to 
that's not okay I'm gonna you know plow myself into it the good thing was that I had two or three people at work that were aware you know not everyone was aware but it was I had enough support and I'd say it was a mix of informal and formal it was that I could go and have a chat with someone if I needed to but also you know there's the employee assistance and that sort of thing um and unfortunately that wasn't quite enough at that point um and it got to a point where I just I, I just didn't want to be here anymore yeah um but again Pets at Home was absolutely there for me and there was a couple of individuals that I'd say if it wasn't for me being able to open up to them I probably wouldn't still be here so that's when I look at my work family and say well if I didn't have them then I probably wouldn't be here or if I was in an orga- organisation that hadn't had that inclusivity that the importance around relationships that alignment then you know that the yeah, gosh, that's well, powerful. It makes you feel emotional. <laughs> Thank you. Save, Thank you for sharing that, that. And that's really brave of you to share. And wow, so important and amazing that you bought, built up that support system. And there is toxic messaging, I think, with don't bring your problems to work. And you're right, some levels, you know, I don't know if you've had a, a very surface level argument with your partner and you can go to work and it's a distraction. That's one thing. And you generally feel better. But if you're really dealing with issues, they're just going to come pound and you know you can only distract yourself for so long so what do you think leaders can do because mental health and navigating it is really tricky you know because some you may ask someone are you okay and they're like yeah I'm fine you know and it maybe takes like a Christmas do or after work drinks or a social for someone to open up because they're not necessarily going to do it over a desk so what kind of environment can we create where people feel safe to open up about those situations because like you said not everyone's going to bring it to work because they may not feel comfortable but often it is just someone opening up uh, but are you okay like you know and talking about it away from the office or or whatever yeah I think I think for me it's creating that environment that where people feel comfortable to have a chat where they build relationships that go beyond the right, this is our, you know, goal for this week and mm. these are the tasks that we're going to do today or this is the project that we're working on. I think it's like five minutes at the start of a call to just have a little chat about your weekend. Yeah. Um, so from a leadership perspective, I think it's, and I remember reading something about this, the the impact of, of one-to-ones. And if you're a leader and you have, say, five direct reports and you do not, you say you don't have time to put in half an hour a week or, you know, half an hour fortnight with them then you know you need to think about priorities and actually yeah. are you in that right position to be supporting those beneath you because I think that that's a, that's a huge thing for me in when we say people at the heart of delivery you you literally cannot do anything without your people um and I think you know we're designing and delivering and implementing tech and, and data-driven solutions for people you need people to deliver them so ultimately we're you know we're all at the heart of everything so if you don't look after your teams you've not really got anyone to drive profit at an organization yeah and that's the thing like happy teams are more profitable but yeah one-on-ones are very much like can be seen as a burden for the leader but I mean, I know from my experience of being on both sides and then it means so much to you that catch up, that one on one time with your manager because, you know, you're kind of ready and it could be work related or not. And we implemented something at Mirai, which is walk and talks, which were quite good. And again, like not everyone, some people are like, can we go on a walk and talk quite regularly? And I'm happy to do that because I think then there's not the pressure of like looking opposite each other. You're just walking around, you know, it's not going to be work, work work related and so things like that can help but yeah that time is so crucial and I think in a lot of organizations you'll find that managers and leaders will cancel or reschedule they'll prioritize a client meeting or whatever it is and you as a person feel like you're just being pushed aside and you're not as important and so in terms of organizations you've worked in is this something you've driven or the organization has driven um I think I think I've been inspired by some incredible role models. Yeah, is what I'd say. So when I think actually of the the couple of individuals that really supported me at Pets, they weren't my direct line manager. Yeah. weren't necessarily even in my um, sector of the business, but they were leaders that showed kindness 
and this is something that I now absolutely embody and, and for anyone I, I work with I certainly do my utmost to, to show these behaviours so if you've got a really really kind leader someone who works with their teams in a way where they they show that they value people yes they deliver and there's deadlines and there's milestones all things like that but at the heart of it the team knows they're there to look after them then all probably majority of people working around that leader will show the same behaviors yeah you're right and then you've obviously got the the opposite and i've seen both where you can have a leader that is seen to be toxic and that could be just in how they treat people it could be in terms of what they prioritize or just you know their demeanor in the office people working directly under them will not they might think it's okay they might not even if they don't you sort of it it becomes a natural thing to take on a little yeah. bit of that and especially if you're you know it's someone at a senior leadership level that is going to massively impact so then you've sort of got this fight between good and evil um t- to put it bluntly so i think it's as a leader you have a obligation and a responsibility to behave in a way that is healthy and happy for the organization mm-hmm. that makes people feel happy healthy and valued because if people are happy then they are more likely to do better work they're more likely to enjoy their work if someone is not very happy you're not going to get their whole self you're not going to get them going that extra mile um, and ultimately you're not going to get a team that gels either because that, that's something that's really important from a data delivery perspective cross-functional often agile teams are really important mm-hmm. having the right people working on the right thing at the right time um, and if you think and I always refer back to you know Tuck, Tuckman's model around the as group development and yeah. it's the form um forming storming norming performing there's a reason why performing comes at the end Mm. because a team gets together they have to figure out their differences they have to work out ways of working they have to get to a point where they feel happy and safe like you say that psychological safety and sort of comfortable and then they're going to deliver and i absolutely think you know that's such a well-known model and it's the simplest of things but yes you have to go through a little bit of pain but to get to deliver effectively and efficiently you've got to have a happy healthy valued team yeah it's so true do you know if you said to like the average person on the street what are the three main traits you need to be a good leader a lot of them wouldn't say empathy you know and empathy is so important but even if you're like an empathetic and and kind leader it may be that you don't feel comfortable talking about certain topics and I'm not saying that's right or wrong but that is the case so what would you advise if someone is coming to their to a leader with quite heavy stuff and they don't feel they're in the best place to support that person what recommendations should they be making do you think so I think generally within a team, and certainly if we're talking about, you know, top end of leadership, they will have trusted peers. Mm. And I think often if you've got a leadership team dynamic right, you'll probably have different personalities. You'll probably have different strengths, different weaknesses. And it's not saying that a leader has to be absolutely perfect at everything. No, look, and absorb everything. Yeah, yeah, they're human as well at the end of the yeah. day. And you're going to have sort of natural different unique traits and that's important you know diversity is massively important in a team Mm. um and certainly at leadership level so i think it's about knowing your own strengths and also making sure there is a safe space available you know absolutely it doesn't have to be you know you're ahead of a department so you've got to sit down in a room and make sure that you can talk you know about everyone's feelings (laughs) i think for me when i look at my situation the person that probably saved my life the most and influenced my recovery the most was like I say wasn't my direct line yeah. manager wasn't my you know in my directorate but I knew they were there so I wasn't looking to my line manager necessarily for support I was looking to someone in the organization who you know was part of the part of the technology community yeah um so I think the main responsibility for you know specific health and well-being is making sure that your team know where to go and but one one behavior that i think everyone can show is kindness yes and i think as long as you are showing kindness and understanding to a level of i get this person and i'm listening to them and 
I think I know what they need and this is how I'm going to help them. It might be directing them to a, an alternative safe space. It might li be linking them up with a, a mentor or, um, you know, some coaching, something like that. But I think it's showing that understanding, that listening. And I, I generally believe that there's not one person in this world that, that can't, you know, can't not choose to show kindness yeah you are right and the power of role models is so important and we are quite amenable as as humans and we do sometimes follow don't we and it can be very subtle if we're following someone who's not showing good traits or sh following someone who is showing good traits you know because sometimes especially when you're starting out like you are very impressionable and I remember thinking in certain places I've worked that certainly weren't psychologically safe like oh maybe this is just what they do you're quite naive almost aren't you and even if you know fundamentally you're a good person with good values you can still question them at time because you just follow the status quo so have you been in situations when you're like that is absolutely not what we should be doing and how did you handle those situations i think we all have mm. i think we've all we can all think back to and possibly less so remote um but when we're in the office we can all think to times we've seen something and we think that's not okay and then you know times we we might see the opposite or we experience the opposite and i think for me it's i sort of knowing inside certainly what i've experienced and i and this probably comes back to the role model piece i see role models at a senior level it could be in tech it could be in data be wider in the industry i see leadership behaviors that i think I want to be like them because yeah. they're respected they deliver but they're a good person and they're supportive and you look up to them and think you know you're brilliant and I think it's important to have the right role models and to choose your role models carefully and to not feel influenced to think well that person's absolutely successful so mm. you know I'm, I'm naturally you know going to follow what they do because I think Sometimes, like you say, if something happens in a work environment that you think isn't okay, generally most people will agree on that. It's more if you are leading a team, there are little, you know, every little thing can be almost naturally followed, not yeah. really consciously. Yeah. You just tend to, if you've got a role model or you have a mentor or... You know, you think sort of back to families and, and siblings, you know, sometimes you see resemblances because it's just been social conditioning. It's just part of their environment. Yeah. So I just think it comes back to it's absolutely the responsibility of someone who is a role model to others. And we could even be talking, you know, about anyone in an organisation that, you know, works with a peer. You can have a peer that inspires you. You can, you know, see them doing great things or you can see the way they behave. I think we've all got a responsibility to create safe spaces pockets of kindness and ultimately that will then be contagious as people move around the organization um you know i think back to you know beyond certainly the few colleagues that particularly saved my life um i think to others in you know the organization i'm currently in past organizations can just be someone speaking at a an organ you know an organizational event and you think you know they're funny they're charismatic they're smiling they're talking about really interesting topics they're warm and you think that's a nice place to be yeah you gravitate towards that yeah absolutely i think energy is so important it's one of our values that good energy but it's like you know that and that doesn't mean you're always like oh let's go you know 100 percent. but it's just like that a good aura a good vibe about you and i think that's really important to build that and like you said one bag bad egg or two can shift that completely and um, but i think it'd be interesting to go back to earlier on in your journey because you mentioned you went to university for a bit and then you got an apprenticeship which i think is key because you know really for social mobility inclusivity university just isn't an option for everyone and not even from a financial perspective people learn in different ways and um, so could you just talk to us about that journey yeah, so, and here comes the irony. I <laughs> went to university to do an English language and linguistics Did you? degree. Absolutely. Communications writing. Um, that was that was where my sort of traits lay. Mm -hmm. um, certainly not in maths, certainly not in science, which, wow. you know, generally... Not a STEM girl. No, people generally tend to think, you know, data team, I've got to have maths or I've got to have, you know, IT. Absolutely not. There's, like, we've talked about the whole delivery and people side of, of, of data and tech. 
um, so yeah, I went to university three months um, in Sheffield, loved the uni, loved the city, um, but I just, I think I just missed home generally. Mm. And I, and anyone who works with me now will know I have to be busy. I am used to it. multitasking, not that I'm advocating that. I I have to have loads on the go. I'm not good when I have gaps in my diary, just generally <laughs> I, I work better like that. And I think, you know, fresh this week, I'd come from a sporting background, so I wasn't a massive drinker. Um, I just, it just didn't seem for me. And when I look back at, so I went to um, a grammar school and the only option was university, especially if you're academic as I was, um, you know, come out with three A's, straight to university you go, you don't do anything else. So, and this is certainly something that I think of with my kids, obviously four, four and three, so not quite there yet, but they should absolutely have the opportunity to look at all the options that are available. It's not yeah. just that you, you go to school and then you go to university and if you don't, you go and get a job. You know, certainly now there's loads more op options. And I look back at what I did and it was effectively an undergraduate programme um, at Lloyds Bank right. in relationship management. So again, quite a people-focused people, people mm -hmm. focused, um venture um, and there was actually only three of us that didn't have degrees that were on that program so it was sort of a good mix but it was straight into experience I think I did four different roles um, around relationship management for commercial businesses in, in two years so I got loads of experience um, then I went into managing private banking clients then my communications bit came out because it was a massive organization I got into marketing then I was working with digital, got into digital and suddenly, wow, you know, I sort of yeah. follow this this path back. And I think if I hadn't have gone into an organisation where I had those opportunities, would I have figured out what I wanted to do or had the option to try things? I'm not sure. So I think it's definitely being open to, certainly if you're a parent and you've got, you know, children, teenagers looking at options, it's exploring all the different things that they can do. You know, whether it is an apprenticeship, whether it's, you know, even whether it's going off travelling for a year. Um, yeah what whatever it is that helps them learn about themselves grow figure out what they excel at what they want to do because again it comes back to that satisfaction and that that's that that mental health piece of discovering who you are um because i'm really open now i absolutely have therapy and i know lots of us do um even if i hadn't been through some particularly challenging times I think I'd do it anyway because it you, you start to figure out how your brain works why you have certain behaviors why in times that are hard you start to behave in a certain way and this is absolutely we go back to the leadership piece what I, I think leaders should mm -hmm. you know should should at least be open to because you then know how you come across you know how you handle stress you know how sort of what motivates you and certainly again from a leadership perspective you have to have your downtime too you can't like you say you can't be full of energy you know buzzing around there for absolutely everyone and not look after yourself yeah and this so is true this is a big learning for me that if i don't look after myself i can't be the person i want to be at work you know you you come first if you don't look after yourself you can't look after others whether that's your kids whether that's your friends whether that's you know work colleagues so yeah. i think for all of us it it starts understanding who we are it starts at home um and then we can you know bring our best selves to the world yeah definitely and i love your journey because there is a negative connotation with like people dropping out of university and you know it's even that language is so negative but why just go into something for three years knowing it's not for you but the fear of failing for example and you know people who say 25 26 27 even older don't know what they want to do oh they still haven't got a career or but they're just finding themselves and as you get older you're like oh my god 26 27 it's no age i mean i changed my career at 29 it's not super old but you know, I knew I didn't because I was teaching in Japan um, and I love teaching, but I knew it wasn't my career. But yeah, there was an element of it. It's like everyone else around me who's managing me is way younger than me. But it's not, it's just being brave and having that support structure around you, isn't it? But I do think we need to change like the whole education system after, you know, at school, there's so much pressure. Like you have to at 16 make a decision of what you want to do. You don't even know what half your options are. I mean, you're still told about the very basic doctor lawyer hairdresser 
<laughs> you know, and I'm, I don't know, I've had conversations about this before with people who came in to talk about apprenticeships and it's it's just like understanding the options really, isn't it, that are presented to you. And in 10 years time, they're going to be completely different anyway, the way things are innovating. But I think, yeah, it's not having that pressure that, you know, there's so many people in jobs that they're just plodding along because they, they're fit, they're, mm. they're scared to change. And I think upskilling is so important as well. Like, so wh where, how old were you or what stage in your career? Career were you when you moved into data? Um, I just to touch on that point actually that you just said. I've got a story about that. Oh, good. I still remember it was around three months that I dropped out. Like you say, dropped out. That was the term. Yeah. I went back with a couple of my friends to visit my grammar school, um, and I will never forget the look that the the one of the I can't remember who they were. I said they wouldn't name if I could remember. Um, I just remember the look and the comments that I got around. Oh, you dropped out, and it was that look and it was that disappointment. Oh, and I just remember coming away thinking, what am I going to do? Because at that point, I hadn't I hadn't got anything. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and like you said, that it was just presented to me as the only thing. Yeah, um, but it's actually really brave because I'm sure there's a lot of people that got more debt were drinking more than they'd want to do, were maybe unhappy in the situation just because of the fear like, I can't possibly drop out, drop out. But really mm. it's just you being brave enough to be like, this isn't for me. So what's the point of wasting any, any more time? Yeah. Life is precious. Absolutely. But yeah, that's awful. So did you go back to the grammar school and talk about your experience then? It was, uh, to be honest, it was just a social visit. Right. Um, I think, you know, catching up with friends and then seeing, you know, how people were getting on. Um, you know, and when I, when I look actually, I knew plenty of people that had had gap years. And I think even I, at the time, it was sort of instilled into me that, oh no, you know, that's just wasting time. Like you say, I've got to get on. I've, I've got to progress, you know, especially if I'm not at uni. And I probably up until recently and probably up until the point, you know, I almost lost my life. I think I always had traits like that and probably comes from the sporting mindset as well yeah. on that achievement that I have to, you know, do a million things at once. I have to run every morning. I have to be there for the kids. I have to work all the hours. Um, and actually only now I'm starting to slow down a little bit and think, right, what what do I need right now? Let's not got, get down on what's happened. Let's not push ourselves to the nth degree. Let's just think, right, what's important to me? So work is always going to be important, but my kids are important. My health's important, but let's not take it to the extreme. Let's just mm -hmm. think step by step. What do I need to be my best self? You know, if my kids are important, what do I need to be the sort of healthiest and happiest for them? Um, and you know, when I'm moving to a new job, fairly recently it was okay let's just take a rain check you've come from having a back-to-back -back diary endlessly as you know as we can all often get into the way of that let's just start again and think right what are your work life sort of boundaries and what's your balance so on the days so I co-parent now um the days that you've got the kids hang on I want to finish at three and pick them up because they're my days the days I don't have them absolutely don't have to and I think it's just about setting your boundaries and parameters to go how do I look after myself in the best possible way to have a sort of happy and healthy body and mind yeah and if you are looking for a goal at the end of that like productivity performance whatever you will probably achieve them in that state of mind like my new business mantra is go slow to go fast because I've just made so many mistakes just rushing into things and thinking I need to do everything at once and investing in lots of different things and ultimately reaching burnout myself so now I'm more considered with the choices I make and the business is actually doing better for it and you feel happier <laughs> <laughs> and this comes into data delivery frameworks yeah. as well. So absolutely, um, what we're looking at at the co-op and what I did at Pets at Home was let's cut down the work in progress. We're all trying to do way too much. We're all busy, but actually what are we busy at doing? Yeah. Um, so you're right, it's about working on less at once and also that discovery phase, that understanding before you just plough into rushing on with something is ab absolutely the right thing to do. I always used to say, you take more time in understanding, refining, getting all your facts, requirements, um, understanding your MVP, understanding, you know, your business stakeholders and your users, you know, securing their, their engagement. Get that right first, then you can plough off and deliver. The worst thing, as we all know, is you start working on, um, you know, certainly look at a data product or a, a tech initiative. Let's just start working on it and, and figure, out, figure it out as we go. Yes, there's an element of agile working, but you've got to have done 
you you know your, your discovery ultimately up front mm. to then deliver efficiently so you're right just steady at first make sure you are working on the right thing make sure you have got the right people make sure you understand enough so you're all working together on it at the right time make sure you're set up correctly then you go then you can be agile yeah then you can you know adapt yeah. as you go along some people listening may think that that time and process in the building is luxury because some organizations they want a return in investment so you know if you go to the, the meetings and the like so, so what are you doing like what are the tangible results so do you want do you preempt that that's going to be a conversation and do you stick by the fact that no this is important the discovery phase is important again i think that comes down to your prioritization process yeah. so as part of your delivery framework discovery or you know scoping whatever you want to call it should be a section of that when something has entered into your pipeline mm -hmm. so i don't think there should be anything that you're even looking at if it's not strategically aligned if the person asking for it can't articulate the value if you have a tech business plan if it's not in business plan again you've got to be questioning it who's the sponsor does it ultimately go up to someone on the exec who would back it and i think if you answer all those questions and it's all a yes okay this seems to make sense then you are very clear on and also you've got to have the right setup for this i think mm. you get the right experts together to go okay how are we going to tackle this what does this look like um you know if you're cross-charging the cost of business for exception for example are they signed up to okay we don't perhaps have enough people right now you know you're gonna have to sort of fund some of it i think it's all of those questions and again that with that close working with the business it's those relationships that understand him and this mm -hmm. obviously comes back to data literacy which is a big thing at the moment um it's does your business understand data to a point to know you can't just produce a dashboard in half a day yeah. um you know just creating some you know data pipelines from a third party pulling it in modeling it do they understand even at a high level that process of how data gets from a to b what the architecture is um you know how it should be designed what's the colleague experience do they understand all those integrating parts and is your data team as well nicely aligned with your experts in design with your you know architects that look after the enterprise systems your it support your change team how is your business structured to again get the right people together in a coordinated way um in a way that they can be happy working together to deliver something so important not always that easy though oh absolutely not <laughs> it's hard so yeah. what are the, the the key like i suppose the, the challenges that you see and you try and overcome like on a regular basis so i think and this is probably com common i think across certainly the retail data industry at the moment many organizations have come from small pockets of data experts mm. in different domains within the business so mm. i don't know take a um a business with for, oh, i'm gonna have to talk about pets at home imagine this is just an example say you know they've got the retail side they've got the vets and um, they've got so retail and stores e-commerce um you know you've got all these different domains and i think a lot of businesses are going through the process and as, as pets did where they they become a centralized data yeah. team yeah you know, that might be to create a lake a warehouse um or it might just be to bring all the experts together and you know there's no there's no right or wrong answer here there's you know you can be do decentralized you can do centralized but now what i think is happening with the new tech and tools and innovation that's coming out i think the centralized team is needing help with all the work that's coming in all that prioritization and generally are going more into domain sort of base squad squads and teams again so i think they're aligning with okay there's this part of the business has this strategy so again our data experts need to get that they need to know say from a if, if you've got a vets business they need to understand what does that practice need to run what is the difference between a vets and a store which we know there's, there's a massive amount of difference yeah. between that but if you're a you know massively centralized team of resource you've not got that understanding so again the value and it doesn't necessarily translate so i think there's this transition at the moment of sort of decentralized centralized and now centralized but with that that understanding of the people that ultimately 
you know data is delivering for yeah and i love that you said earlier that about managing expectations as well and educating the business on what is possible what is not possible um because then it causes friction doesn't it because if they've asked you for a dashboard for example you haven't got it in the time scale that they thought was appropriate then they don't think that you care about their request or, or whatever and there's just a breakdown in communication ultimately so that's where the communication piece comes in and for you have you learned on the job or is a lot of what you know theory that you've put into practice i would say it's a mixture mm. um because i think it depends what organization you're in as well in the setup so i've been in organizations where you sort of end up doing more than your role and you you know perhaps there isn't you know five or six different discipline disciplines or different teams that are needed perhaps there isn't the you know the budget for the resource and you end up doing more than your role so you sort of have to pick it up yeah um and the the one thing i did when you asked before about when i moved into data um probably about four years or so ago now but i always ask the da- ask the daft questions because i yeah, hate not good. understanding something <laughs> yeah. so i love nothing more and nick walk will tell you this i am right in there with the data engineering team when i join you know a new a new organization or part of an organization to go right what tools are you using? Show me, like, let me get, from a delivery perspective, let me understand the steps that you're going through right now. You know, is there a way that we can make it more efficient? Or actually, am I just trying to upskill myself on what happens so that when you are partnering with the business and, you know, you're talking about a new strategic initiative, you know the steps and you can translate it so you can do that, translating the tech to the business speak. Yeah. And I think, you know, data literacy is on the up in terms of its importance. Yeah. And it is, it is really important because there's pretty much everything seems to be about data and AI at the moment. Um, and I think for non traditionally non-technical people to understand, you know, what does data mean? You, you hear a lot with businesses at the moment saying, I want to put AI in. Well, why? <laughs> like it's a solution. It sounds good. <laughs> exactly. Sexy. So what is your actual problem you're trying to solve? Maybe yeah. have that a solution to, to use if that makes sense. So I think it's, it's that understanding of, um, when you are trying to achieve something, the steps to get there, and yeah, it, it's it's generally that understanding. I think that's important. It's key as well, being vulnerable and like the only silly question is the question you don't ask. Mm-hmm. And we've all been there in a meeting or you know watching a panel, whatever it is. It's like you're dying to know a question, but you don't know ask it. And then at the end, you go, "Oh, can I just ask you a question?" And you know, I suppose it's like a confidence thing. But most of the time, like if you don't know the answer it's more silly listening to the whole meeting that you you've you've kind of lost yourself in it because you that's one thing that you, you don't understand um so that's key and is that part of a culture that you build as well when you're leading for people to always ask questions and communicate this comes back to that safe space yeah I think it does again, it really that does psychological safety that when we say kind it's kind in a in an open environment sort of way that people have the confidence to go can I just ask what that means? And I think I've always role modelled that that's one thing. You can guarantee I'll be the one that sticks my hand up in a meeting. Um, And I did a talk for a delivery community a a while back, which was a mixture of delivery leads from different organisations. And someone asked me there around, you know, how how technical do you have to be as a delivery lead or, or delivery manager? And I said, this is what frustrates me the most, that there's this perception of, delivery managers um have to be technical mm. you know there might be a need for that in an organization somewhere but you've got experts in your team there's a reason you have brilliant data engineers there's a reason you have brilliant visualization specialists from a delivery perspective you bring them together you don't have to know everything you shouldn't yeah. feel you you know you're coming into a role and i think this is what puts sometimes women off mm. more people centric roles in the tech space you shouldn't feel that you have to know everything that's why you have a team it's the same from a leadership perspective that's why you have a diverse peer group because you're not expected to to do everything you're expected to know everything and i think it's appreciating the different talents and identifying mm. and that's one thing i've done when i've moved to the co-op I've, I've figured out right who do i need to go to who knows about you know how data quality works here who can tell me about the engineering systems who can tell me what the bi strategy is i don't need to know it but i need to have an understanding yeah to yeah be able to you know work with sure. the experts who do yeah and people that are comfortable and confident and willing to share and it, this sounds like a really basic example but you know obviously we qualify candidates all day every day and some of them i asked to go into detail and they'll be like well it's on my cv I'm like, 
well, it's not on your CV and I need to understand, you know, what you can do, the depth of that, explain it to then the client. But that unwillingness to share just shows that I imagine part of a team, they're not willing to share. And then other people I talk to will literally tell me like how they coded this whole platform at home. And I'm like, I love you. This is what I need. You know, and some people have that passion behind it, but others are quite closed off, aren't they? And they're just like, well, you should know that answer. I've already explained that to you. And that isn't going to get anyone anywhere is it ultimately yeah absolutely (laughs) and I think it is creating that environment where everyone even introverts feel okay to put the hand up and go can you just explain that or what does that acronym mean you know every single business has acronyms yeah lots and you know you you come into a new organization and naturally there's you know there's going to be things you don't know and I think it's so important to create that environment where everybody feels it's okay to not know everything they're not going to be laughed at they're not going to be judged I think often you know we can have our own sort of insecurities that we have to handle but a business can help that by creating that welcoming kind um inclusive environment and I think it's you're going to get people quickly up to speed in that sort of environment so much quicker yeah be inquisitive be curious which is fundamental isn't it within data and it shows you care as well if you're asking questions you just want to like understand don't you rather than just your work you're curious about what other people are doing Absolutely. and so we're going to move on to the the quick fire data lightning round what is one common misconception about data that you'd like to debunk it would be that everyone in data is not super duper technical or has not come from a technical background originally yeah so important name a book podcast or event that every data enthusiast should explore oh simon sinek starts with why love that book also yeah it's you can apply that to everything can't you but it really that fundamental purpose he was saying i listened to on a podcast the other day he's changed the dictionary because why is now a noun as well after his book coming out Uh yeah he's quite proud of that achievement but yeah it's a good recommendation (laughs) finish this sentence data is the key to the future it is what is one piece of advice that you'd give to someone just starting a career in data be inquisitive yeah ask questions keep your eyes open and talk to as many people as you can yeah absolutely looking to the future what do you think will be the greatest development in data in the next five years oh the big one (laughs) i mean ai is the big one right now isn't it i think what's really interesting if you look at like the latest chat gpt models they're starting to look at rational thought Mm. and i think this this I've always I found certainly AI super interesting because when you think of the people focused delivery perspective, AI is almost trying to. If you look at the the developments, we're all worried about the ethics of it. We're all worried about is it going to replace people? Is it going to replace jobs? Um, we feel it doesn't have that sort of people element. It's starting to get there, mm. and they're really trying. They're trying to you know obviously the the, the sort of chatbots and and the models at the moment lack empathy. They do they're lacking that rational thought well not for that much longer so i'm intrigued to see and i know it's a big question at the moment whether it is a trend you know like the agile was the buzzword um or actually it just keeps on growing and i think there is more to come i think the way the models are being trained obviously there's questions around how much compute is needed to power them but i think there's there's a lot coming in that space um still and i'm, I'm just really excited to see what the art of the possible is in ultimately making our lives easier but bringing in that that people-centric 100 percent. and i think going back to mental health and therapy and i've also had therapy and would 100 percent recommend it but to everyone it's not accessible so this is where apps can come in as well and i've had apps where it's like tracking or whatever and they ask you about how your day has been how you're feeling and you respond with an answer and you don't get anything back and you're like oh wonderful thank you but you know it's not replacing people but at the same time if there is something you can engage with on a level that gives good solid sound advice that's only going to help you know so i that really like empathetic apps with you can voice record into them and i don't know like we said we're not replacing relationships but if it can help people and how they're feeling and give them access to some help that's surely a good thing absolutely because i've been there you know in my in my darkest times late at night 
luckily, I'd say very luckily, the people I'd, I'd shared how I was feeling with before knew to reach out and to get word if they didn't hear an answer or I had a couple of people that I could go you get what's going on I, I just I'm at that point but there was times when I thought I, I can't mind them you know it's one in the morning yeah or I'm feeling alone I'm feeling isolated and often when you look at sort of mental health crisis you know you can be in a room full of people and feel alone and of I think it's can. that it's that isolation that people feel so I think I, I have a, a sort of yeah, I'm, I'm with you on the want of, I think there's there's a massive well-being benefit that can come from innovation with data and tech. Um, as much as, you know, social media and that sort of thing gets a, gets a bad press, I think we can use it for good. Yeah. And I think certainly all of us will go through a space where we feel alone or everything just feels too much. And I think if we can use data um, to just provide you know we're talking about chatbots here just yeah some something to talk to where you don't <laughs> you almost don't have to talk you, you you almost don't have to feel like you're talking to someone to it's be an outlet but, isn't it yeah you like i think voice notes can be quite cathartic so it's like mm. i'm glad you asked me how i am <laughs> i'm gonna tell you <laughs> and even then you can feel better so yeah i think that's a good place to end data for good ai for good absolutely there we go thank you